Wait, where's Sean? Uh, he didn't want to be typecast. And to think that he ended up as Dr. Henry Jones Sr. <laughs> so who's the new guy? Uh, one George Lazenby, an Australian model. A model. Acting. God, haven't these people heard of Megan Fox and Rosie Huntington Whiteley? It was the 1960s. Give him a break. And at least give the new guy a chance if it's just for one movie. So Bond has been on the trail of Blofeld for some time now, a year in the novel and two years in the film, but to no avail. He continues tendering his resignation, M takes him off the case, but he gets back on the trail of Blofeld thanks to the fact that he saves the life of one Countess Teresa de Vincenzo, the daughter of Marcos Draco, the head of the Union uh, Corsa, sort of a, I believe, Portuguese mafioso type group. Bond is brought before Draco and is given the proposition of courting and marrying Tracy in Draco's effort to calm her down, normalize her, that, that sort of thing, if you will. Bond reluctantly accepts, and he slowly courts Tracy, of course, in exchange for information that Draco has on Blofeld. So they part ways, and Bond goes after Blofeld in the Swiss Alps. Since we last saw Blofeld, he's gone under massive plastic surgery, and it seems like he's trying to turn over a new leaf by claiming to be descended from some sort of royalty. So Bond goes undercover as a London College of Arms genealogist, uh, with the title name of Sir Hilary Bray in an attempt to draw him out. Bond does some investigating and discovers that Blofeld is up to germ warfare through hypnosis to cure allergies. A might outlandish, if you will. Anyways, Bond escapes the resort, reports his findings, and calls in Draco and his cavalry to take down the mountaintop resort. The cavalry does so, and Blofeld escapes with Armabond, his personal secretary. So, Bond closes the case, marries Tracy, and they're driving away on their honeymoon when Blofeld pulls a hit-and-run killing Tracy. On one hand, you've got a 1963 novel that precedes and directly affects You Only Live Twice. Meanwhile, on the other hand, you have a 1969 Peter Hunt helm film that follows You Only Live Twice and really doesn't show too much in the way of continuity from that, unless, of course, you consider the mission souvenirs that Bond goes through in his desk and the clips that they show in the title sequence. And I guess you could also consider the... Uh, the fourth wall breaking slash tongue in cheek sort of line from the beginning of the film. This never happened to the other fella. However, Blofeld doesn't recognize Bond. Does this mean that Bond's a Time Lord? No. Regardless, the plastic surgery that Blofeld has had allows for Teddy Salavas to take over for Donald Pleasance. Uh, does anyone know who these actors are nowadays? Sure. Kojak. And Pleasance was most well known for his role as Loomis in the original Halloween films. But as for an adaptation, it's fairly faithful, albeit some scenes were switched around a little bit, a few scenes were added, the character of Tracy was bulked up, and, you know, Blofeld's scheme is a little bit more global, among other things. The increase in scope does allow for a greater global impact. Yeah, threatening germ warfare on the British Isles, eh, not the biggest of splashes in the pond, but threatening germ warfare on most of the nations of the world, yeah. Cannonball in the pond. The only real global aspect, however, is the women being treated for their allergies. You've got women from all over Europe, from Israel, from China, from Jamaica, among other nations, of course. And the locale is Switzerland, so there really isn't too much exoticism there. Unless you want to consider Tracy's mom's search for the exotic, possibly propelled by a subconscious desire for rape. As for the women apart from Bunt and Tracy, well... Bond using my guess as side missions or bonuses that don't really matter, if you will. They're described as being one-dimensional and rather dumb or ditzy, or what have you. Side mission complete, seduce at least one curious or interesting woman to earn their trust, gain some bonus intel, or what have you, even if it means reusing the same pickup lines. Tracy is simply a stronger character in the film. She's more prevalent, for one, and you get to see more of her evolution during their courtship as she goes from loveless and possibly not depressive to balanced, and well, more balanced at least, and in love, still a risk taker all the while. She doesn't disappear partway through the novel as Bond is setting up the mission and investigating Blofeld. Plus, she defends herself against Blofeld's goon wounds when the cavalry invade the mountaintop resort to take out Blofeld and rescue Tracy. And plus, she's played by Diana Rigg, who's best known for her work on The Avengers, and don't tell me you don't know what Avengers I'm talking about.
I do. However, you lose a bit of Tracy's backstory. Yes, you get her marriage through an Italian account, but there's a difference between finding out that your husband died in a Maserati with his mistress versus abandoned you and left you with a baby daughter who died of spinal meningitis. As for Irma Bunt, she's described as being a mannish yet matronly sort of wardress, probably a little bit better than Rosa Klebb in From Russia With Love. She lacks a sense of humor, she has sort of this yellow sunburn sort of aura, and she doesn't really seem too personable. Working back to Bond, we come to the middle ground of gender, sexuality, and identity issues. There really isn't much overall in the novel, but the women at the resort in the film take Bond to be gay initially, among other things, because he's bookish, doesn't show much of an interest in them, and they kind of think of him as being allergic to them. But he surprises two of them. As for Blofeld, he's described as having a bit of a gay lilt to his voice, but he hasn't really posed a threat to Bond's sexuality. And now that it's Draco, even though, of course, Bond develops uh, a respect and love of sorts for him. And Bond, of course, does get married, so he really doesn't do much policing of gender, sexuality, or identity boundaries in this film. And he really isn't as much of a national symbol, more of a global symbol, because he's, of course, trying to prevent a global catastrophe. As for Bond, Lazenby adds more depth to the character than Connery really did. I mean, would you rather have a flat woman as a super spy, or would you rather have a super spy with heart, who shows emotions, who can actually hold his cover when he's given one? I had pressure to go with the guy who can hold his cover, and who is driven by more than just sex, and who actually wants to provide for his wife rather than, you know, be in debt to her father. So, while on Her Majesty's Secret Service, wasn't the best received of all Bond films, it still provides a refreshing, realistic breather as far as between Connery films, as it doesn't rely too heavily on gadgets, does have, you know, a good deal of spectacle that is a bit dated, and contains more motion than previous Bond films. Next week, Bond tests his luck in Vegas. We were Las Vegas, baby. No.